and to welcome on to the podcast uh, Wolfgang Richter, a less trainer who I feel like I know very well, even though I probably don't. I'm not sure. I'm not sure why. I know you can be the answer to that. Um, and uh, a, a, a good constant attender of less conferences. An all-round good guy, very experienced agile practitioner. But to give you the full introduction to Wolfgang, I'm going to hand over to him and let him just uh, introduce himself to everyone listening and watching. Wolfgang. It's really a pleasure to be on your podcast. And hey, guys. Um, well, my introduction, um, <laughs> that's always a challenge. I don't know why. You know, what is really important about me? I mean, my name is Wolfgang Richter, as you heard before. Uh, I'm, I'm a proud certified Les um, trainer. I'm also a certified scrum trainer. So I have the combination, uh, combination of these two certifications, which is probably not the most important thing about myself, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> it's part of my education. So, um, I think as you said, I'm a very experienced scrum, uh, Les trainer. Well, um, I'm in this, in this industry, I'm in this trainer job for i would say about 20 25 years now not just for less and scrum but for other topics i mean also project management in a traditional fashion i've done before and things like that uh which is really something i really like i mean i think teaching is is the part of my job i like most yeah uh coaching consulting guiding as whatever you want to call it uh, is also fantastic <laughs> but i think i'm really a teacher uh, that's that what describes me best yeah um and i'm a very curious person so i'm interested in way too many things in way too many things so <laughs> it's not just agility it's not just scrum i'm i'm i think every time i see something new i'm i'm getting interested in it immediately which is probably my the strongest part of me but also the weakest part of me <laughs> so yeah i think that's about it i'm a father of two beautiful girls who are well at the moment, <laughs> you know, what's going on out there. Um, and yeah, I think that's it pretty much. The rest will follow. <laughs> what was the most, uh, what's the most obscure thing you've been interested in recently? The most obscure thing. Oh, uh, I wasn't prepared for this question. So I need to think a little bit. <laughs> so yeah, uns unscripted question. I didn't prime you for that. I'm sorry. I get, I get curious. I get curious. Um, uh, the most obscure, obscure thing. I mean, I think the most obscure thing I'm really interested in, and this is not just uh, recently, this is for the whole time of my life. I would say as, as, as soon as star I started getting interested in science a little bit is time travel. <laughs> Bloody hell. Time oh, travel. Yeah. Is it possible? Yes. In my personal opinion, yes, but not in the sense Hollywood describes it in a different way. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I was, I was gonna, I was just gonna go on eBay and maybe see if I can find it. Yeah, 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 nah. it's a, a different kind of thing, <laughs> I, I, I guess. But I think it's oh, yes. Wow. <laughs> ha, like, oh, I really want to ask, how is it? How like, is it possible to explain to a layperson then how? Briefly, how you think it's possible? Um, I think it depends on the structure of time, which is not very well described. And uh, I think what Hollywood describes is always going back in in one. You know, it's like the the mainstream. You know, the like in in coding, you have your yeah. If we talk about merging and you know all that kind of things, there's always this main track, and this is what Hollywood describes mainly. But I think time is a way more complex structure, which means you can go back and forth in time but that means also you relocate at the same time so you i think it's almost impossible to go back in time and to return to the place you've been before i think that's almost impossible but if you think about it like a river like many rivers uh flowing side by side you can go from one river to the next one but it goes also up and down and back and forth so you can jump in the water but the, the water is constantly changing and that's the most complicated thing. But you can change the river. Yeah. And so that's why if we if you go into the past and you can't come back, that's why we haven't. Uh, maybe, yeah. 
<laughs> that's maybe the reason. Yeah. Maybe because it, it's all happening in, in, yeah. in another river. Okay. Yeah. As much as I would love to explore that more deeply, I, I think the it's a different story. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different story to cover. So let's talk about let's talk about yeah. large scale scrum rather than DeLorean yeah, yeah. and, <laughs> and rivers, Love dreams, yeah. different dimensions. So the question that I like to start with is always around an elevator mm -hmm. pitch for less, and it goes. You know, I'm, I'm, I wonder should I have chosen a different question. I'm not sure because I haven't had many really solid elevator pitches. So I, I, I normally do a little bit of a setup and explain how you know, you're walking into a big building. It's the company you've always wanted to work with. You're so excited at the opportunity to be there and work with this company. And there's like 60 floors. You get into the elevator. Lo and behold, the CEO is there. Who He's on the fence. He's on the fence. He's not too sure about less. I'm going to add a bit more qualification. Yeah, they, they've already looked at their problems and they can see that less could be helpful, but the CEO is still a little bit unsure. You've got your elevator journey to, to pitch to him or talk to him about less. What would you say? Um, and I was prepared for this question. <laughs> so I noted, uh, I noted it down because, you know, elevator pitches are really interesting because you have to come to the point which is probably the most important message to this person who is with you in the in the elevator and if you talk about the ceo of course they are not so much interested in long sentences in long descriptions explanations specifications whatever so i thought about myself what would i love to hear if somebody talks to me and wants to make it more interesting for me, me to, to ask more questions about it probably to make a decision to do it if someday <clears throat> and i think it has to be at only two sentences. And I thought for myself, what are these two sentences or maybe three, right? Um, and I noted it down because I wasn't able to remember it, <laughs> to memorize it. So um, I have to read it from here. Um, for me, the elevator pitch for less is, less is a descaling framework to simplify collaboration in product development and to help focusing on business and customer value. It is based on Scrum, but goes a bit further. So larger organizations can benefit from the ideas of Scrum too. And I stole a sentence from a marriage counseling organization and adjusted it to less for less. Uh, if anything works for scaling, less will work. <laughs> Brilliant. You win. And you, you, you win. If, it was a competi if I was running a competition <laughs> so far, I think Thank that's you. the best elevator pitch <laughs> I've heard so far. Um, I like it. Please I'm gonna, do. I'm going to use it. That's okay. I'll get a T-shirt made with it on, mm. and I'll wear it to the next less conference. Yeah, that's so everybody great. knows who I am. Well, no, everyone, everyone will think everyone, everyone will think I'm you. Then that's what will happen. I'll walk around with this quote, and it will have your name <laughs> on the bottom, and they'll think I'm wearing a T-shirt with my own name on. I want one. Or <laughs> um, that's I brilliant. You, I'll, I'll make you. I'll, I'll get you one. I'm kind of feel like great. I've committed myself <laughs> to this now. Um, <laughs> no, thank you for that i think it's I, I love the fact that you distilled it down to a couple of sentences i think that's really no, important no. you don't get a lot of time to to talk to to talk to certain yeah. people and it's where what is the hook what is that yeah. what, what is the one thing you can do to just to not to sell it to them but to pique their interest and exactly. make them want to have the conversation with you your, thank you very much your pitch to the good job thank you very much for that mm -hmm. now the next question did less choose you or did you choose less? <laughs> That's a good one. I love this. Um, I would say a bit of both. I mean, I was interested in frameworks for a while now. I mean, I stumbled over Scrum in, it was, I think it was 1999. Uh, the first time I, I got in contact with what, with what we call agile frameworks nowadays was extreme programming in 1998. So, and then Scrum somehow followed. I can't even remember how I found it. I mean, it was 1999. It was not Googling for it. It was not 2000 books and things like that. But it was something I found. Uh, there was a small community around the world exchanging ideas. And that's how I got interested in Scrum. And it was pretty much the same for less for me. So, because 
when I started with Scrum and introduced it in our organizations where uh, we, at which I worked yeah, back then, um, I started writing, I started working on a PhD thesis of a couple of years later, so I think two or three years later. No, actually I wanted to start in 2001. So when the HL manifesto came out, but nobody had an idea of at the universities what I was talking about, because what is agility, you know? Uh, it took me two years to found a professor who was really interested in experimenting with this new kind of ideas. At, back then it was pretty new. So, um, and it was during my PhD thesis when I found this book, the first book Bas and Greg uh, wrote, right? And I was impressed by the thorough work that did uh, around this. I mean, it was not a framework it's a description, it was, uh, many descriptions, many ideas, uh, but they fit my, to my experiences and to what I'm interested in very well. So it just matched, you know, and so I took it also as a reference for my PhD thesis, which was about uh, organizational structures, project management and agile software development. Uh, and from there on, it was pretty clear for me that less becomes part of my, yeah, working habits of my working environment and so on. And later on when I found out, okay, I can become a trainer. That was then the point of time when I said, okay, I want to do this. I want to teach this as well. And I want to exchange these thoughts with others. So it was like I said, a bit of both. Wow. So you did a, you, you completed your PhD and you're a doctor then. Yes, I am. <laughs> wow. I think I, I wrote the very first PhD thesis about agility worldwide. <laughs> That's impressive. How many more have there been? I wonder. I, I don't know actually. <laughs> I mean, I, I wrote, I wrote, I read m many master theses until now. I also accompanied some of these theses later, later on. But PhD thesis, I don't know actually. Interesting. I wouldn't even know where to begin looking. Um, <laughs> but no, so you're less trainer case study what was your case study uh my case study was about the Mer mercury insurance company yeah uh this was this is also my favorite one i think uh this is one of the questions so just to jump to this question <laughs> if if you want to ask me that um yeah do it then let's, let's go say so, yeah, the question you're referring to is uh what was your favorite less adoption yeah yeah yeah, uh, yeah, yeah answer uh, it please do no, it was uh, it was the Merco Insurance Company. Uh, because why? Uh, because we started with Scrum there. I mean, they failed with a replacement of a system three times. So this was the 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 pain point they had, and this thought, okay, in a traditional way with traditional project management and requirements facilitation, etc., it did not work three times. So let's try something else, and this was then Scrum and Agile. Uh, I was there as a Scrum master for three months in the beginning. So, um, and also trained another uh, person there to be become a scrum master. I also introduced scrum to the organization and so on. So, but more to the IT department first. Uh, so it was a transition for one team only. And this worked very well. So after, after a year or so, I think they, they said, okay, we want to continue and we want to scale that. So for the other teams we have in the organization, and that became less than, of, of course, because I was there. <laughs> they could have chosen any kind of framework, but it was less because I was there. Um, and I think it did fit very well. Uh, it was not just because of me, it was because it was a perfect fit for the organization. And um, yeah, and we continued a partnership. We also did development there. My colleagues did development there. So it was not just the coaching consulting part. It was not just teaching it. It was also doing something, you know, producing something. And why it is really my favorite uh, transition is because uh, I became friends with many of those guys there, with the people there. So it was just not just the, the job. It was also on a social level that we got closer. And yeah, we still call. Wow, that, was a, that was a twist. It was. <laughs> that was a twist. I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't expecting that. It's nice to hear. Why do you think you made such good friends? Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, it was a, a success for the organization. Yeah. Uh, it was really nice talking to these people. I mean, they we always found something to talk about, you know, and we had say, similar ideas. 
we, we were able to benefit from each other. I mean, you need to, you need to understand the Merkel insurance company is an organization which was founded in, I think, 1789 or something like that. So it's pretty much more than 200 years old, you know, and all these processes and structures they had, some of them were more than 200 years old, I guess. Um, so that means I benefit, I did benefit a lot from this situation because I have no, I haven't been working in an organization which was that old, you know. So I learned a lot from them and they learned a lot from myself. So it was an exchange, a, a beneficial situation for both parties. I think that that really was uh, important for our friendship to, to grow. One question, I, I don't really delve into these types of things, but I'm curious, I don't know why I'm curious about this today and not other days. Were you able to achieve what we would call in less a perfect definition of done for the product you were working on? No. Did you get close? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there is always one element which is not, I mean, what is perfect? I mean, this, this is a philosophical question, I guess. <laughs> we can't have another podcast about what is perfect. Um, no. Seriously, I mean, what we want to achieve is very often that we have really at the end of a sprint something we call done and there is no work le uh, left, yeah, no undone work as we less people call it. Uh, but um, <clears throat> uh, what we were not able to integrate is DevOps, I mean, operations. Uh, but this has also some legal aspects behind it. So I think there is in every, in every transition, every situation, there is at least one element which cannot be incorporated into the definition of done for whatever reason. But especially, yeah, in an organization like that old, I'm guessing. I mean, the product you're working was it a new product or were you working with legacy? A legacy. Yeah. Legacy. It was a replacement of a legacy system. So it was a new product, but there was legacy. And, you know, many other systems, not the product, I talk about systems now. Uh, many other legacy systems, which are really, you know, the hosts and so on, which are 50, 60 years old, and you, and you have to integrate them, stuff like that. So it's really a lot of legacy. <laughs> yeah, blimey. I, I need to, I have to admit, I've never read your case study, but what I'm going to do is when I, it's terrible, isn't it? No. Have you read mine? It's not. No. <laughs> I don't know. No, actually, I, I must confess, no, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 I sneaked into each of the case studies for a couple of pages, but not entirely. Yeah. And the case studies just, I don't know, they feel like they just keep getting longer and longer as well. Mm. You know, I want to, I, I was contemplating maybe going for the BMW one and trying to make a little summary of it mm -hmm. myself. Yeah. Points. But I will go, when I put the link to your case study into the show notes, I will absolutely give it a read. Mm -hmm. Cool. Because, uh, yeah, why not? It's about time. <laughs> I need to read them. I've got all these books in the back, but yeah. I find it I find it easier with a physical book. Yeah. For me too. You know, looking at a screen, I find yeah, it a little bit. It's for me the same, yeah. Well, thank you for that. So your favorite lesson option was your first? It was, well, I wouldn't call it my first, actually. I mean, officially, yes. But like that before, you know, all these experience, uh, everything which was written in the books, uh, Buzz and Greg's ideas, it was the same thing I did before I even knew about less. So I would not call it my first less uh, adoption. It was just the first one, which which, which was called less adoption. <laughs> I, I think that there are, me and uh, Jürgen de Schmidt spoke about this. Um, around there's lots of people that are using less at the moment that we just don't know about and lots of people that are using something which is less like which they don't yeah. know about and how important is it for them to to be able to point and say it's yeah. less but I, I think it's more important for us to find find the stories and share them because there's so many people out there that are doing something which is less like consciously yeah. and because because it isn't a formal less adoption it will never end up on the less website as no, a case study. Exactly. Brilliant stories out there, which which people could really do with hearing. Yeah. I think. 
And does it have to be 100% less? I don't think so. It must make sense. It must improve something. It must help the organization. Whatever you want to call it, I'm really not interested in the names. I mean, I love less. I love Scrum. I, I love all these kind of things. But whether you call something Agile or not, I don't care. <laughs> Seriously. It, it shouldn't. It yeah. shouldn't matter. And this is why I have made a big deal in my training in the last couple of years in trying to stop using the word adopt. Yeah. What? Because a, a, it always feels, it, in people's minds, it always seems to conjure up this idea that it can be completed. So I just tried to say, like, do you want to, how, do you, how are you going to yeah. use it? How do yeah. you use that? So understand what you want to use it for, first yeah. of all. And then figure out how much of it you want to use. Because as you mm. said, there's no perfect mm. less adoption. No. Exist. And don't get me started with words because if you talk, I'm very interested in language and, yeah. you know, semantics and, and meanings of things. And if you talk about adoption, what does that mean? I mean, you adopt a baby. Yeah, it becomes part of your family. Yeah. yeah. So, But you don't adopt the framework so that the framework becomes part of your, I don't know. Does it make sense? I always... Yeah. Think, I've, I've struggled with this. I've really, I, I can't, like, I've never adopted a child. I've oh, adopted yeah, cats. Yeah. <laughs> Me cats. too. But, um, but I've got a friend of mine, a really good friend of mine, who's probably one of the best humans that I've ever met. And he he's adopted some mm -hmm. children, quite a few children over the years. And I, thought, I want to talk to him about it because my guess is that when you, you, know, when you adopt uh, a child, they become part of your family and you don't always say this is my adopted son or daughter my adopted child they just become part of your family and the, the yeah. adoption is done it finishes and then and then you want them to be you want to see yourself as an yeah. entity as a family unit and i think this is why i prefer using the word use just because i've got a better word yet because it just it tweaks the way that people think about it and you're right because there's no perfect less adoption you can't like perfect definitions of done are yeah, really I'm, hard yeah. to find so you will never have a perfect less adoption if you don't have, you know, if you're having a, having a perfect yeah. definition of done. I'm using, I'm, I'm wagging my fingers around for <laughs> like speech brackets here. So I, I think it helps people make more considered, intelligent choices if they're not hung up on just trying to use yeah. every piece of it. I mean, you know, for me, less is a perfect, uh, a perfect, a vision of perfection, you know, a perfection vision. We, we have this concept in less anyway, but not just in less, of course. And I think uh, I don't have the exact quote for that in my, my mind at the moment, but I think Bruce Lee was one of the guys who said, a vision is something you probably never can reach. Yeah, you can never get to that state, but it gives you the direction to aim for, and it helps you to aim for it. Yeah it makes you more focused and concentrated on your track, on your way, on your, yeah, on the orientation. But do we need to reach it? I don't know. Some, it's always a journey, you know, the journey means it's a lot of steps in between. And if it takes a hundred steps to come to the perfection, maybe 50 is good enough. And then it's not hundred percent what we would call probably less or scrum or whatever. And it's, yeah. And just to round this off, and that's the thing that depresses me a little bit is that some of these great stories, some of the useful experiments, some of the great tales of things that have gone well and bad, the mm -hmm. great opportunities for learning won't ever mm -hmm. end up as a, as a formal case study. So this is why I'm on a bit of a mission to try and discover some of those less stories. Mm -hmm. so if you have a less story that you want to share or a less like story, or even a story about how you think <laughs> less is terrible because it Wrong. I'd love to hear it. Go okay. to lessmatters.co.uk. There you can get in. Anyone can get in contact with me there, and just like okay. spam me with less stories. Think, we'll get you on. Yeah, I will. spread the word, <laughs> Wolfgang. Um, okay, so for those listening, we are going to have a short break. When we come back, we'll be finding out. Uh, what's the one thing about less that Wolfgang loves above all others? So sit tight, listen to a little message, and we'll be back. Here's my Ashley thing. It's a fake thing. Okay. So welcome them back now from the fake break. I might, I might not even okay. edit this bit out on the video. I might leave. I, I might, I might, I might leave it in for <laughs> comedic effect. Okay. 
<laughs> so that was the main th maintenance break. So. Yeah, yeah. No, no, uh, you really, uh, I should maybe, I should mm. get some good jokes to tell during this. And, I, and then it seems means I won't have to edit it out. I can just be, I can try and be amusing. But unfortunately, <laughs> you probably have the same problem as me. All of my jokes oh. are terrible since I've become a dad. I mean, they're pretty bad I, before I became a dad, but now. I can't help you out with that. Funny. It's not, yeah. My jokes, I don't know. I can't even remember jokes. I have, I have only one joke I always tell. This is my favorite one. But I'm not sure if it works in English. It's in German. I, actually, it's an international language because it's not even English or German. You want to hear it? No. It's, uh, yeah, but it, yeah, it's, it's a little bit, it's for people. I think you have to be older than 40 to understand it, I guess. <laughs> I'm there. That's yeah. me, man. I, I, know, I know I don't look it. You can remember Telegrams. <laughs> what is you know? it? I don't. I'm not talking about the app. <laughs> I'm talking about real <laughs> Telegrams. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and there yeah. was, you know, this Telegraph station, this post office, whatever it was called back then in these years. And there was a dog going uh, to this post office, and he wanted to send a telegram to a friend. And he said, "Okay, here is the text," uh, and he sent it to the the clerk there. Uh, the text is woof, 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 woof. And the guy in the post office says, well, if you have one more woof, if you want to send one more woof, it gets cheaper because it's 10 then. And the dog says, well, then it doesn't make any sense anymore. I like I, I I think that's I think that's genuinely funny. I know if I told that to my my little boy, two little boys, <laughs> they would be like, "Damn, dad." Okay, thank you very but much. Yeah, I, I think it's good. <laughs> I think it's good. We should do. Mm. Like, we should have less stand up at the conference. Oh yeah. That'd be uh, terrible. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> After that short little interlude, the only joke I could think of is. Um, very childish, and I and I like and not even my not even my okay. children laugh yeah. at it. You ready? Yeah. Oh, do you, you know the format of knock knock jokes? Yeah. Okay. So. Um, okay. Say so like prepare yourself. This is terrible. Who's there? Uh, knock knock. Done up who? Done up. <laughs> oh, you done up who? Okay. On a podcast as well. That's okay. No, I, think, no, I think it's nice. Absolutely. I love it. Well, I'll make that into the teaser. Yeah. I'll just have you yeah. on a loop saying done a poo. Good idea. <laughs> I, won't, I won't. I won't. Right. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, uh, let's do that. Let's resume, shall we? Uh, everyone watching, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, and. Welcome back, everybody. Good to have you back here. I'm sure that the tension of needing to know what Wolfie's uh, number one top thing he loves about less is kept you hanging in through those messages. So without any further ado, Wolfgang, what is your favorite thing about less? The thing you love more than less? Yeah, I think the favorite thing about less for me is... Uh that it focuses on the Agile principle number 10 a lot. So um, reducing the amount of work, um, simplifying the way of work. Um, that's I think that's very important that these are key ingredients for every healthy and sound working environment for me. So, and I think Les is focusing a lot on that. And this is, um, this is something I aim for in every kind of thing I do actually. And probably that's what it made really attractive for me. You're very succinct with some of your answers. I like it. So less is about simplicity. And there is the agile principle, simplicity, the art of maximizing the amount of work not done, which I've always loved because then it really forces you to focus on, well, what is the important work to do? Yeah. Now, you were talking about perfection vision or less being a perfection vision, or maybe an organization mm -hmm. having a perfection vision. Mm -hmm. Do you feel there's any relation between having a vision for how things could be, or you want them to be, and this idea of simplicity? Is there any relationship between those? Um, 
of things how they could be in simplicity or relation. I mean, I think there is definitely a relation, just trying to think what it might be. Uh, I mean, a perfection vision for me is always that you can achieve what you love, what you like, that it feels good, that you ha are successful, whatever your goals are, that you can reach your goals. And if simplicity helps, then it's probably already a perfection vision, in my understanding. I love it. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was, I had a seed of a thought when you were talking then, and wondering that perhaps having that vision, that North Star, the thing that you can judge your decisions against, mm -hmm. helps you maximize what you don't do. Because I always find that when you talk about maximizing what you don't do, people get nervous and think, oh, you're just trying to dodge doing the work. But that isn't the case. So let's not do the wasteful stuff. Yeah, so if absolutely. you have something you can gauge your decisions against, hopefully that means you minimize the amount of wasteful stuff. You can do. Yeah. I mean, I think what comes to my mind is a, a sentence my younger daughter said about two weeks ago to me, or now actually to her grandmother, and her grandmother told me that she said that. Uh, very interesting information, I know. <laughs> um, but what she said actually is, you know, uh, Grandma, why I'm so bored? Because we have too many things to play. I don't know where to start. And that made me thinking, you know, it's really like children and not just the, uh, my children. It's also what I see. If I look around in my home office here, there is way too much stuff. Yeah. I said I'm interested in way too many things. So I'm very often distracted by um, by new stuff, by things which are not really important, which distract me from what I really want to achieve, what I really want to do. Uh, and they cost time and they cost me nerves and then I can't finish the other. So, so it's more getting started with something than st getting done with something, you know? And that's uh, I, even, even I myself, if I, I know all this from the theory inside out, of course, but even I stumble into this trap sometimes, you know? And I stumble into it all the time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's a common common trait, I think, with humans. I'm not even going to say agile practitioners or people who understand agile and people that should know better. I think it's a common trait with humans. Is we often, many of us, just have too much. We start too much and don't finish enough. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I I really started getting rid of stuff more and more. <laughs> yeah. Are you getting rid of any old uh, computers, like old 1980s computers or games consoles? Let me know because that's the one thing I do. Yeah, you see those two behind me? <laughs> yeah, I did have my eye on those. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. <laughs> you can see my, uh, my Atari 2600. Uh, the plastic okay yeah. cool and my zx spectrum is down there actually uh -huh. very nice with the very the very cassette that taught me how to read mm. cool Fantastic. that's why i'm such a terrible reader <laughs> <laughs> and the, the books are a lie the books just wallpaper the books are a lie. okay wolfgang thank you very much for that now the next question mm -hmm. if you could change one thing about less and i mean less and overloaded uh, meaning of the word here to mean everything around less. What would be the one thing you could change? Is there like a magic one? Yeah, the one thing I want to change actually, and this is, it became much more important over the last two years, I guess, is I would love to change the rule for on-site collaboration. Yeah, I mean, the the pandemic changed the rules of the game a bit, you know, and it's sometimes just impossible to be in the same room or not safe or probably sometimes even not required because I think what the pandemic told us is that on-site collaboration is very important for a certain tasks, yeah, but for other tasks, it's absolutely unnecessary to be in the same room, you know? And, you know, if you do a cost, uh, a co um, cost and benefit calculation behind, uh, being in the same room, that means traveling, you know, and also the the economic uh, impacts you have, the uh, all the impacts which could occur because you're sitting on a plane and going from, I don't know, Vienna to London or something like that. Is the cost benefit ratio then positive or negative, you know? 
And I think that needs to be taken into consideration if we talk about on-site collaboration and that's the best thing. It's not the best thing for everything. There is nothing in the world which is like a silver bullet for everything. It doesn't exist. There's not one medicine for ever for the cure of every disease. It, you have to, to, to be aware of the situation. You have to be aware of the requirements of your surrounding, of your boundaries, etc., etc. And like I said, for certain activities and tasks, on-site collaboration is the best way of doing it. For others, it's even worse than being not co-located. Yeah. And I think that's why I would like to change this rule because it shouldn't be a rule. It should be a recommendation, but for certain aspects. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because then the rules are the rules just recommendations anyway. Should should it be a guide rather than a rule? I don't know. I I, I agree though that I think with the you know, when people see rules, they see it as prescription and something that they mm -hmm. should do. And I think there's probably other less rules that people could get really excited mm -hmm. about in in addition to that. But but because of what's happened over the last couple of years of the pandemic the co-location one has got a lot of mm -hmm. attention and i think yeah we have to accept that and, I mean, and you're, you're absolutely correct i thought there was some stuff where it is much mm. more effective i was doing some work yesterday with a guy called frederick yeah. I think. um he's probably watching his thinking watching or listening to this thinking mm. yesterday this was months ago we spoke about this because this is we're recording mm -hmm. this in march me and frederick were talking about modes of interaction mm. And we were saying, well, there's collaboration where, generally speaking, unless unless you've got brilliantly strong relationships, it's always going to be nicer and probably more enjoyable and effective mm. face to face. Then you've got uh, cooperation, which you know, it's good to do face to face, but maybe you could cooperate. Uh, on, I I listened to uh, an interview with Ari from Benicum last year. You know, yeah. and he talked about face-to-face -face conversation and th th what they had in mind when they said face-to-face -face conversation when they wrote the Arch Manifesto and the Principles and so on, they didn't talk about collocation. That was not what they had in mind, they said. What they had in mind was face-to-face -face conversation so that you see each other as we do here now, actually. He said that's already face-to-face -face conversation. You can still improve it probably yeah. to be in the same room. Yeah, maybe. But face to face conversation, what they had in mind is also like in this digital version. But then I think that every person that you add to that digital face to face, it, it slowly takes something away. Because just me and you, it's fine. And then we add another person, another person. There's a, there's a lot to not to take in when people don't want their camera yeah, on. But the the, the light the light shining in you can't yeah but that's the same if you're in the same room but it's just a different kind of distraction then uh it's always a distraction if you have more and more people if you have 20 people in a room and somebody nowadays somebody starts coughing everybody is distracted because this person could be sick right if you start coughing on the other end here i don't care <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I care if you're. I hope you're not getting sick. But... Oh yeah, thanks. <laughs> Sorry. <about that. laughs> okay, so the the one thing you'd like to see changed uh, around less would be the yeah. co-location. Relax it. Yeah, I I still think it's in many situations it absolutely makes sense, and I prefer it. In other situations, I learned, and I thought that before actually that it's better that you can do things. You don't have to travel or you don't have to live in the same city or be in the same room. You can, simple tasks can be done more easily if you're at home, relaxed, if you can, you know, get something to drink without asking, may I leave the room and things like that, you know. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, <Dan>. Bart. <laughs> now, the less questions we're done with, I'd like to end these this time. Cool. A little, a couple of little agile questions. Mm -hmm. So the first one, this is Agile in general, is a label yep. I put. Uh, what is something in the Agile world that you feel should have been more popular? Um, that's a simple question for me, um, because I think everybody nowadays, and I really mean everybody, if we talk about agility, starts talking about immediately about Scrum or Kanban. Yeah. 
So it's really narrowed down to two frameworks. And of course, the scaling frameworks stand like less. But if we look at these 17 people from uh, who wrote the Agile Manifesto in 2001, I mean, they were representatives of many other Agile approaches, Agile frameworks, standards, methods. Uh, and some of they were great. I mean, like adaptive software development or the crystal family of frameworks, feature driven development, probably. Uh, even, yeah, and so many more. I mean, they are all pretty much forgotten, I think. Yeah. It's just Scrum and Kanban anymore. And I think there would be less failed transitions if coaches would be familiar with at least seven or eight of these other frameworks so that they could really pick and choose what is the best match for this work for this environment not just scrum not just kanban let's look at the environment and let's find the perfect match for that i think that's that's something which people should start learning about again i mean they they talk about scrum kanban and sometimes maybe extreme programming but that's pretty much it yeah and that's not enough in my personal uh, opinion. Less trainers and people in the less world will generally always mention extreme programming at least yep. once, once in every yeah. conversation Absolutely. I've had, I think. Apart from my conversation with a young lady called Salome, mm -hmm. she didn't mention it. Mm -hmm. Everyone else did. Has. Mm -hmm. Bars mentioned a, an approach in his interview, and I can't for the life of me think what it was, but it was something I'd never heard mm -hmm. of before. And it really, and I was like, wow, I thought I'd heard of most of these. But yeah, it was something I hadn't heard of before. I think it was Kent Beck's, Kent Beck's. approach to scaling. Yeah, yeah, there was Kent Beck had an approach to scaling. Or do you mean X Breed? No, let me just have a quick look. Kent Beck's? No, I don't know. I, I, this is why I proved myself wrong. Uh, let me see. This is really boring for everyone. Let me let, okay, let's all listen whilst Ben goes on the internet and tries to find his interview with Bars. Here we are. So, oh, I didn't put it in the show notes. Oh, add it in the show notes mm -hmm. to this one because I really can't remember what it was that he said. But yeah, there was a, a, a framework that I'd never heard of and the one that he had tried with Craig, I think, at some point. He said it was, yeah, but there's some really interesting things in there. He didn't find it that applicable, but he did find it very useful. So I think as a, I would agree with you. There's lots of stuff in, in the agile world where it says this was designed as a history, history book because it wasn't able to ride the crest of the market enough. It didn't apply enough, didn't, dare I say, didn't appeal enough yeah, to project yeah. managers <laughs> or non technical yeah. people. So they never really, never really no, took off. Exactly. And there are many which are really, really interesting and which are really, they have great ideas in it. Um, you know, Scrum is very small, yeah. 17 pages mm -hmm. and the rest you need to come up with yourself. I mean, this is for somebody who is not aware of with that or has no uh, idea about organizational development and so on. It's just not enough. Yeah. Um, and like I said, in other frameworks, they yeah, you could probably pick some elements of the other frameworks and add it to your for your uh, to maybe to Scrum or Kanban and, and 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 create something which works for your working environment. But that's exactly what we should do. We should have this toolbox, as if you're coaches and if you're accompanying um, transitions, adoptions, transformations, you know, <laughs> which is all change management in my understanding. Um, but we should have this toolbox, you know. Like I said, if you have just a toolbox with two tools in it, it's hard to fix something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it is still a toolbox. It's still a toolbox, an empty <laughs> one, a pretty empty one. <laughs> yeah. But you give me a few ideas there, which I might, I'm not going to verbalize those ideas now because then I commit myself to doing that. But uh, you give me a few ideas. Because I do find it interesting. I hadn't really considered. Well, I had considered. Mm -hmm. I had this image in my mind of this dusty old library or a graveyard where all where, where good ideas have gone to die. You know, and I think that perhaps some of those should be exhumed mm -hmm. and studied and, and spoken about a bit more. Because who knows? 
what we might learn. I, I would definitely learn something. I think most people would learn something. Absolutely. And I think what is also important for people to understand if they are trying to help organizations with a or, uh, transformation, uh, transition, uh, is that they need to understand the status quo of the organization. So that means not just agile frameworks, but they need to understand what are standards and methods. Yeah? Where are they at the moment? What's the starting point? So what exactly needs to be changed? I think that's missing very often because people started, let's say, three, four, five years ago, became agile coaches, which is great, uh, of course, but it's not much experience yet already. So if they haven't been familiar with like traditional project management or traditional organizational structures, matrix organizations, etc., it's hard. To oh, this is one of the issues. Like, I love the IC agile, um, agile coaching syllabus. I think it's, I think it's. I think it's a good introduction yep. to individual yep. coaching. I think it kind of is a bit rubbish when it comes to team coaching. So I've I've rewritten my course yep. so that it's actually more useful for team coaching and try to make it a whole team coaching mm -hmm. course. But then, it, and, I, and I like what it's got there, but it is based on this premise that you're a experienced agile practitioner mm -hmm. first, and then this is being built yep. upon that. I don't know how many. People have heard me talk about this in other podcasts, but how many agile coaches at the moment have been or have ever written a line hmm. of code or hmm. tested any software yeah. or ever actually sat down and had to refine a product back for writing with other mm -hmm. people and then taking that through to the point where someone's telling you that actually it isn't what they wanted and it's yeah. much <laughs> or it is what they wanted and get the jubilation of knowing that you've solved a problem yeah. with someone. I wonder how many people have experienced that as a proportion. Yeah, in agile coaching. which goes back to the philosophical question again: What is agile coaching? I mean, or if you're uh, if you're uh, a surgeon or something, is it necessary that you have broken your leg before that you can fix a broken leg? I don't know. That's it. I, <laughs> I love that. That's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> there wouldn't be many doctors, would there? No, that was the case. <laughs> so before you can uh, operate on a brain tumor, I would really limit the number of people that were able to like mm. operate and make the world a much darker place. I I don't see agile coaching as a profession anymore. I see agile coaching as an industry. Yeah. It's an industry, and and people are because it is unregulated yeah. and it is not controlled in any way. People can behave however they want within yeah. the industry, and I think that's and that's part of the problem. And I I stopped I... Call, calling myself uh, agile, being an agile coach. As uh, I call myself an agile guide, yeah. which is nicer than some of the names I've I've heard many a name for agile mm. coaches, but um, some of them, I must admit, have made me shudder okay. a little bit. Oh, really? I'm not going to share them though, because I'm pretty sure those words have only been used by one particular person. I bring all that out there, but yeah. I am also guilty of calling myself stupid things and doing <laughs> stupid things with my career and my head and my my hysterical imagination. I've always tried to avoid calling myself mm. an agile coach. Other people will call yeah. me an agile coach. I teach I teach an agile team coaching mm -hmm. syllabus. But I would never I would never go out and call myself an agile coach because I think it's just because mm. of jargon. Because it's an it's this big homogenous blob of people in the industry now. Um at the moment that organizations turn their hand to producing mm -hmm. agile coaches. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. Commercial product you're working mm -hmm. in that industry. Anyway, yeah. last question. What do you think is going to be the next big thing? Do you have any clues or tips, something you've seen which you think, oh, no, maybe this has got, it's, I think for good or for bad, it's yeah. going to be very popular. What is the next big thing? Honestly, I don't know why i think agility is still worth continuing i mean we're not there yet right i think we're still at the beginning pretty much um but i think what what the the next big change or improvement could be i think is that people start understanding that becoming agile is not a goal uh, for me at least it, it is not i think Agility is much more a vehicle to solve some kind of problem. Yeah, it, it's it's something you can use to improve your organization. 
but first you need to define why you want to change what do you do you really want to improve what is the goal behind that and to think start asking why becoming agile i think that's probably the next big thing i don't think it's a framework i don't think it's a method i think it's more the understanding of it and i hope at least i hope it is <laughs> Mm. I would hope so too. When you were talking, there, I did wonder. It kind of feels like ad, like people say, oh, "I want to go on holiday," and 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 Agile's the travel agent you go to who books you the bus and the airplane and arrange your little trips and the rest of it, and it gets you on the holiday you mm. want to go on. It isn't the holiday. You don't say, "I want to go on holiday," yeah. and someone's like, "Well, here's a bus." Like, well, I'm no. like, that is not. I don't want to spend the holiday on a bus. No. <laughs> No, no, yeah. no. Where's the bus going? Right. No, so it is. It's could you say yeah. vehicle? For me, at least vehicle. it is. That's that's my Brilliant. uh metaphor for that. Yeah. Well, I hope so too. And then maybe if we all try mm. hard enough, we'll get there one day. Mm. Maybe by the time we retire. Wolfgang, thank you thank very you. much for your time today. It's been awesome to have Bye. you on here. Now, if people wanted to find out more information mm. about you. Where could they do that? Uh, first of all, uh, on our homepage, which is www.chip.it. It's J I P P dot I T. Um, yeah, you can find the next webinars, whatever is coming up uh, on this page. We also have a YouTube channel with uh, the Chip IT YouTube channel. You can also find uh, information there. Um, and I think that's pretty much the best source to start from. Right. Well, Wolfgang, thank you very much. I'll put all that information in the show notes. I will be subscribing to the YouTube channel. I was very pleased. The uh, My YouTube channel hit 100 subscribers the other day. I was sure. over the moon. It's a small milestone. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a simple pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. But Wolfgang, thank you for your insightful comments, You're your welcome. great conversation. Thank you for being succinct and to the point as well. It's been nice to kind of get through the questions in, in, a, in a sensible period of time. <laughs> So thank you very much for coming along. Hopefully we'll have you back on at some point to talk about something else, maybe the uh, Agile agile framework, Agile approach graveyard. Mm -hmm. yeah, Let's see. That would be great. <laughs> that would be nice. Let's see what we can exude. Maybe it be a Halloween special. Oh. See, now I've, now I've said it and now I've committed myself yeah. to it. But with, you know, masquerade. <laughs> yeah, we can yeah. do that. Some of, you know, some of the less trainers don't need masks. <laughs> I, won't, I, won't, I, won't, I won't mention names. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you said that. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wolfgang, thank you. Everyone who's listened and watched, thank, thank you very you. much. We will see and you'll hear from us again at some point very soon. It was a pleasure. So be sure to uh be sure to pay attention. Sorry, Wolfgang. It was a that? pleasure for me to be here. Thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, it's fine. It's a pleasure. I'm I'm here to serve. <laughs> Everyone, thank you. Thank you, Wolfgang. Take it easy, stay thank safe. You guys. See you soon. Bye. <laughs>